Please be seated. Yes, please continue, Ms. Gustafson. Thank you, Your Honors. As I mentioned before the break, the defense version of a supposedly lawful military campaign is so permeated with contradictions, it is unsustainable on its own terms. For instance, the defense claims that orders to comply with international standards were promulgated and passed down the chain of command. Soldiers and officers were trained on these matters and they consistently complied with them. See, for example, paragraphs 1850 to 1852, 1907, 1911, and 1948 to 1951 of the defense brief. Elsewhere, however, the defense asserts that SRK officers and soldiers were untrained, inexperienced locals, and that this lack of training and experience negatively impacted command and control, resulting in frequent problems of discipline and disobeying orders. That's paragraphs 2329 to 2330. So while on the one hand, the defense posits a strictly IHL compliant military campaign, a, ca a claim that is utterly defeated by the weight of the contrary evidence, on the other hand, the defense puts forward a secondary inconsistent argument apparently aimed at accounting for that evidence. The secondary ev uh, argument also fails, however, given the overwhelming evidence that the campaign was orchestrated at the highest levels and implemented through an impressive command and control structure. And I would refer to our brief at paragraphs 612 to 642 and 682 to 697. In another such example, the defense asserts that it was impossible to distinguish civilians and combatants by their clothing and therefore that, quote, SRK forces had to assume that any person venturing near the front lines and within range of infantry weapons constituted a threat and could be a potential target, end quote. That's paragraphs 1907 to 1908. Elsewhere, the defense asserts that SRK members took every possible precautionary measure and refrained from fire if there was any possibility of hitting civilians. That's paragraphs 1911 and 1925. Again, these inconsistent claims appear aimed at claiming a lawful military campaign while attempting to account for masses of contrary evidence. And while making these claims about the supposed precautionary measures taken, the defense ignores contrary evidence from its very own witnesses, such as Slavko Gengo, who admitted to freely responding to, to fire by launching shells into urban areas from several kilometers away while taking no precautionary measures. That's transcript page 29781 to 29782. And while the defense cites Mile Slare at paragraph 1927 for the proposition that, quote, civilian casualties could not always be excluded, end quote, Slare in fact acknowledged that firing into urban areas entailed a high risk of civilian casualties. But like Gengo, he asserted that this was the other side's problem, <coughs> not his. That's at page 30573. Gengo and Slarie's descriptions of responding to ABIH fire by launching shells into civilian populated areas with total disregard for the obviously high risk this entailed for the civilian population illustrate a level of disproportionality indicative of an intent to target civilians or civilian objects. In any event, overwhelming evidence shows that the vast majority of SRK fire in Sarajevo simply targeted civilians or civilian areas and was not even ostensibly responsive to ABIH fire. 
And I would refer in this regard to our brief at paragraphs 731 to 732 and 765 to 771. In the sniping context, at paragraphs 2171 to 2173, the defense claims that it was never the task of SRK snipers to open fire on civilians, relying almost exclusively on self-serving and plausible assertions by Galich, Milosevic, and other SRK officers. This includes express reliance in paragraph 2172 on Dragomir Milosevic's astonishing claim at page 32821 that SRK snipers never open fire on civilians. And clearly the defense does not even believe this claim since in the immediately preceding paragraph the defense acknowledges civilian casualties through sniping and attributes this to uncontrolled snipers. And the source of this contradictory proposition, also Dragomir Milosevic. These kinds of contradictions permeate the defense arguments. In another example, in paragraph 1959, the defense brief claims, quote, necessary assessments were conducted prior to any shelling campaign in order to ascertain the possibility of collateral damage, end quote. Citing again to Milosevic at transcript page 32582. But Milosevic did not say this. Instead, he offered another completely incredible assertion, claiming that the SRK never fired at areas where civilians were present and said nothing about collateral damage assessments. Rather than accurately repeat such a blatant falsehood, the defense adjusts it to fit into its paradigm of asserting a lawful military campaign while attempting to account for the volumes of contrary evidence. Similarly, in paragraph 1952, the defense cites Stevan Valjevich's evidence for the proposition that brigades were prohibited from firing on targets in areas such as Rosno, the Sharshia, and the hospital. Although Velievich did mention these specific locations in the cited passage, he continued his answer with the sweeping assertions that it was forbidden to fire on any targets, quote, in the depth, end quote, quote, in the town, end quote, or in, quote, urban neighborhoods, end quote, and attributed any shells that, quote, hit the town, end quote, to incorrect data or wet gunpowder. That's page 29282 to 29283. Another piece of incredible testimony that the defense has elected to mold into something presumably more palatable. In paragraph 1937 that you can see here, the defense couples a blanket denial that SRK units fired at the Kosheva hospital, schools, nurseries, or commercial buildings with the therefore irrelevant claim that any decision to fire on such buildings would have taken into account the presence of civilians and whether the building was a military target posing a danger. These contradictory claims are based on Dragomir Milosevic's contradictory testimony at page 33136 through 33138, where he categorically denied firing at such locations before admitting to firing at such locations under certain circumstances. Yet another failed effort to explain the SRK shelling of civilian areas nowhere near the confrontation lines is revealed in paragraph 1953, where the defense claims that, quote, the SRK had information of military targets deep in the territory of the first ABIH Corps, end quote, including, among other claimed targets, command headquarters. The defense ignores Milosevic's testimony that the SRK never fired at any ABIH command posts, 
33127 to 33129, and a mission that accords with the observations of internationals. Konings, for example, explained that shelling near ABIH command posts was rare, and most shelling impacts were not near military targets. That's P1953, paragraph 30. Similarly, Fraser explained that during his entire time in Sarajevo, the ABIH First Corps headquarters, despite being a key target, was never shelled. That's page 8006 to 8007. I'd like to turn now from these tangled efforts by the defense to fit the evidence of its SRK witnesses into its version of events to the few defense efforts to support its account of a supposedly lawful military campaign with contemporaneous documents. These efforts are also mired in contradictions. For example, the claim in paragraph 1944 that, quote, orders reiterated the fact that civilians were not to be targeted, end quote, cites Milosevic's order D, three, uh, sorry, two eight, two five eight zero. Nowhere does this order say that civilians were not to be targeted. However, it does state in paragraph four, quote, do not forget about retaliatory measures or any other issues which must become prominent in the case of fighting, end quote. In paragraph two, the order also instructs brigades not to wait for Corps command decisions on, quote, minor issues, end quote, such as, quote, should we block Umprefor, end quote, or, quote, should we seize weapons that are under Umprefor control, end quote. And these instructions in Milosevic's order directly contradict defense claims elsewhere. For instance, at paragraph 1838 to 1844, where the defense describes the leadership's supposed genuine efforts to place SRK artillery under Umbrafor control and the almost total compliance with the agreement to do so. And while I'm on this topic of the total exclusion zone agreement, I should mention that those claims are also undermined by the very evidence relied upon. For instance, the sole source for the alleged sincere intention of the leadership to comply with the total exclusion zone agreement, described at paragraph 1841, is Vladimir Lucic's bald assertion to that effect. But what did Lucic say when he was confronted with a series of contradictory documents? He disclaimed all knowledge and insisted his unit was 70 kilometers away from Sarajevo, facing the other direction. That's transcript page 30792 to 30797. Again, this part of his testimony did not find its way into the defense brief. At paragraph 1932, the defense cites D2810. This is General Galich's supposedly strict orders to limit behavior that was not legitimate in combat. As you can see, this order forbidding the use of larger caliber weapons without permission of the Corps commander or his deputy says nothing about limiting illegitimate behavior. <coughs> and the Corps commander's exercise of control over large caliber weapons, quote, until further notice, end quote, is entirely consistent with the large body of evidence demonstrating that the terror campaign was centrally controlled. And I would refer in this regard to our brief at paragraphs 614 to 627 and 654 to 659. The defense also relies on Mladic's order, recorded in P2419 and P2420, which reflects Mladic's reaction upon discovering that local authorities and the SRK commander 
were planning to remove Umbra 4 controlled weapons and use them to fire at civilian targets in Sarajevo. The defense cites this order twice, mischaracterizing it both times, as this slide shows. At paragraph 1934, the defense brief says, quote, General Modic forbade the use of weapons of bigger caliber on civilian targets, end quote. While at paragraph 1949, the brief says, quote, an order from Ratko Mladic prohibited the firing of large caliber weapons on targets in Sarajevo without his approval, end quote. What does this order in fact say? P2419 says, quote, I forbid firing from large caliber weapons at civilian targets in Sarajevo without my approval, end quote. The language of this order is a transparent reflection that firing on civilians in Sarajevo is accepted behavior, as long as Modic's conditions are met, i.e. <coughs> small caliber weapons or main staff approval. Faced with this, the defense simply asserts it says something else skirting key language in the order to make misleading points. The defense also ignores the express rationale for this order. Mladic states that the planned removal of Umbra 4 controlled weapons to fire at civilians in Sarajevo could have, quote, far-reaching negative effects on the Serbian people, end quote. He makes no mention of any negative effects this would have on the civilians in Sarajevo who would be fired at. And P2419 also contains a handwritten warning, quote, UN teams have been invited to identify combat actions aimed at our combat positions, end quote. In other words, this is another clear example of modulation. Mladic is preventing violations of the total exclusion zone agreement in an effort to avoid international intervention. And it is a further reflection of the centralized control exercised over the terror campaign. In other words, another failed effort by the defense to fit the evidence into its version of the campaign. At paragraphs 2392 to 2395, the defense claims that the SRK was forced by the other side to wage war in Sarajevo in the manner it did. The centerpiece of this argument is the claim that, quote, fire was coming from everywhere, the entire city, end quote. That's paragraph 2393. And the defense cites to 101 SRK combat reports between 1992 and 1994. When these reports are actually examined, however, it is clear that these defense claims are a wild exaggeration. The vast majority report ABIH fire from unpopulated areas with ABIH positions, such as Mount Igman, Jutz, and Hum, frontline positions such as Butmir, Moimilo, and Hrasnica, or areas in the outer circle miles from Sarajevo. A total of just 16 of these 101 combat reports indicate artillery or mortar fire coming from anywhere in the city center. And in spite of the repeated claims by defense witnesses that the Kosovo hospital area was a quote unquote daily source of ABIH fire, for example, Injic D2774 paragraph 109, one of these <coughs> 101 reports reflects outgoing fire of any kind coming from the Kosovo hospital area. That's D3411. For the most part, the defense has declined to directly engage with the enormous volume of prosecution evidence that directly contradicts its version of the campaign. The few efforts to do so also founder. For instance, at paragraph 1962, the defense incredibly asserts that, quote, UN observers never asked the Bosnian Serbs to cease fire 
nor did they report illegal use of artillery fire, end quote. This cites to the evidence of Dushan Skirba. The defense has taken the evidence of one witness whose experience was temporally, geographically, and institutionally limited and turned it into a sweeping proposition while ignoring the tremendous volume of protest evidence in this case. Evidence that includes admissions from both Galic and Milosevic that they received such protests. For example, page 37642 and 32705 to 32706. The only direct effort by the defense to address the consistent observations of UN personnel that the shelling and sniping was directed at civilians is at paragraph 1960, where the defense claims, quote, when the SRK fired a small number of shells only to stop the enemy fire, thus showing restraint, this was sometimes characterized by UN observers as a harassing or terrorizing fire against civilians, only because it was not concentrated, end quote. Now, this entirely mischaracterized mischaracterizes the evidence of UN military professionals who agreed that the SRK practice of firing one or two shells at a time into civilian areas was random, serving no military purpose, and could only have been intended to terrorize civilians. Konings, for example, contrasted the concentrated fire that would be necessary to destroy a military target versus what he observed over and over. Rounds landing far from any military targets, shelling which had, quote, no military pattern, end quote, quote, just firing single rounds into the city, knowing you were always hitting something, end quote. That's P1953, paragraphs 30, 35, 38, and 96. Or, as Brenskog explained, quote, in my experience, single rounds do not form part of a normal military offensive. They provide little or no military advantage. This indicates to me that the aim of such fire was not to hit military targets, but instead to terrorize the civilian population. And he added that this occurred several times a day in June of 1995 resulting in purely civilian casualties. That's P1851, paragraph 31. Other similar examples are in our brief at paragraphs 731 to 732. The scheduled shelling incidents exemplify this pattern of firing single or small numbers of rounds into civilian areas. For example, G5. A single mortar round explodes amongst a large group of civilians lined up to collect water, killing more than 10 of them. Or G6, three mortar rounds fired into Alapashinopolia, killing six children who had been playing in the snow. Or G8, a single mortar round explodes in Markley Market killing more than 60 people and injuring 140 more. No restraint is exercised when deadly shells are launched into civilian populated areas for no military purpose. This was clearly aimed at spreading terror among the civilian population. And in making these claims about supposed SRK restraint, the defense simply ignores the evidence of the SRK's indiscriminate bombardments of the city, bombardments that occurred throughout the campaign. Bombardments in which, quote, fire rained down all over Sarajevo, end quote. That's Van Linden describing G2 at P926, paragraph 55 or the precisely coordinated bombardments on both 24 December 1992 
and 7 January 1993. Bombardments whereby at exactly midnight, every Bosnian Serb gun, mortar and tank was deployed in a massive barrage, firing, quote, across the length and breadth of the city, end quote, in spite of the fact that there were, quote, very few military targets in Sarajevo which could be engaged by heavy weapons in darkness, end quote. That's Tucker at P4203, paragraphs 109 to 114. Other examples are in our brief at paragraphs 727 and 736. The defense claims of a precise, cautious, lawful campaign cannot even begin to account for these massive, indiscriminate SRK bombardments. So the defense tells its story of the campaign as if such events simply did not happen. The defense version of the campaign also can't account for the scheduled shelling and sniping incidents. Incidents which illustrate the pattern of targeting civilians engaged in obviously civilian activities. Children playing, women collecting water, civilians shopping or obtaining humanitarian assistance, far from any military objects or military activity. Faced with this evidence, the defense brought two expert witnesses, Mile Popovic and Zorica Subotic who constructed elaborate theories aimed at establishing that the SRK was not responsible for any of the sniping, mortar, or artillery incidents, and with respect to modified air bombs, that these were precise, accurate weapons launched only at military targets. In Appendix C of our brief, we have explained how these theories are speculative, unsound, and in many instances, outright absurd. I refer in particular to paragraphs 7 to 12 and 43 to 47. And we have specifically addressed their theories for a sample of the scheduled incidents. See paragraphs 9 to 11 and paragraph 45 of Appendix C. Today I will expand on how these experts' flawed methodologies permeate their analysis of the scheduled sniping and shelling incidents with a few additional examples and address some additional arguments on the scheduled incidents raised in the defense brief. One general argument the defense raises at various points in its brief, including in connection with many of the scheduled incidents, is the claim that the Bosnian authorities were responsible for attacking their own civilian population in an effort to provoke a military intervention. For example, at paragraphs 1968 to 1979, 2181, and 2311. While the defense asserts that, quote, several such incidents took place, end quote, that's paragraph 1976, rarely does this argument venture into the territory of genuine analysis of real events. Most of the defense evidence is based on rumors or vague allegations outside the scope of a witness's personal knowledge and coming in large measure from witnesses with little or no credibility. This includes the vague claims of Milosevic, Galic, and Sharnats, cited at paragraph 1976, or, for example, Milorad Shehovatz's statement that he heard, quote unquote, rumors to this effect, but had, quote, no direct information, end quote. That's D2633, paragraph 38, cited at paragraph 2181. The defense also <coughs> distorts and mischaracterizes the evidence. For instance, in support of the claim at paragraph 1976, that the ABIH shelled civilian facilities in an effort to falsely blame the SRK, the defense cites three SRK combat reports, none of which say anything at all about the ABIH firing on its own population. And those are D3411, D2633, and 
D3424 and D3442. The defense also mischaracterizes a raft of prosecution evidence, including that of Harland, <coughs> Thomas, Mole, and Fraser. In one typical example, the defense claims at paragraph 1972 that Fraser, quote, even remembered that some French soldiers came across a Muslim TV crew filming a staged attack with children, preparing to use it on TV against the Serbs, unquote. In reality, Fraser did not, quote unquote, remember this. He testified that he had heard stories, but stressed that he had seen no such film. That's page 8051. The defense goes on to claim that Fraser's, quote, assessment was that the Muslim authorities were guilty of targeting civilians, end quote. Clearly suggesting by the context that Fraser was referring to the Bosnian authorities' own civilian population. However, Fraser made clear in the very passage cited that this was not the case. He said he did not recall ever saying that there was an ABIH policy to target their own civilians. That's page 8054. And as Jeremy Bowen explained, and as logic dictates, it would be impossible to keep a conspiracy like this secret. And certainly, if any substantial portion of the campaign had been executed by the ABIH, the world would know about it by now. And I refer to Bowen's evidence, P2068, paragraph 39. And while the defense made its claims about the ABIH targeting its own civilians in Sarajevo, a centerpiece of its case, the handful of weak, vague claims that ultimately emerge only underscores the prosecution's evidence that the SRK was responsible for the overwhelming majority of attacks on Sarajevo civilians and any possible exceptions were at most de minimis. And I refer in this regard to our brief at paragraph 795. And in the face of overwhelming evidence of an SRK campaign of sniping and shelling civilians, the defense argument also defies logic. In the, in the midst of this existing SRK campaign, any effort by the Bosnian authorities to target their own people in order to falsely blame the SRK for a few additional attacks would have been an extremely high-risk strategy with little or no political benefit. The only conceivable way the Bosnian authorities could have imagined provoking Western military intervention in this regard would be to stage a large-scale massacre. But when such conspiracy theories are taken out of the realm of conjecture and applied to real facts, as Subotic attempted to do so for G8, G9, and G19, the resulting explanations are completely unhinged from reality. And I will be getting to those unhinged theories shortly. For a number of scheduled incidents, the defense makes a related argument that the prosecution has failed to prove that the bullet or shell originated from SRK territory. However, these arguments focus improperly only on the ballistics analysis of the incident. Even if the chamber were to find that ballistics evidence alone for one or more of the scheduled incident does not conclusively establish the source of fire as SRK territory, this does not translate into a failure of proof. Although in each of the scheduled shelling and sniping incidents, the ballistics evidence alone points strongly, if not conclusively, to an origin of fire in SRK-held territory, this evidence fits within a much larger body of corroborating evidence, evidence we have highlighted in Appendix C of our brief. For instance, for many incidents, the ballistics analysis points to notorious sources of SRK fire targeting civilians. And the locations of the shelling and sniping attacks themselves also fit within a broader pattern of areas in which the SRK 
regularly target civilians. A number of shelling attacks involved multiple mortar or artillery rounds. Similarly, many of the sniping incidents involved repeated fire at the same location, either before or immediately after the victim was hit. Such conduct simply does not fit with a theory that the perpetrators were attempting to falsely blame the SRK. And this is because the firing of multiple rounds or multiple bullets would greatly increase the risk of detection with little or no added benefit. And of course, each of the scheduled incidents, by their nature and effect, fits squarely within the overwhelming evidence of the three and a half year campaign by the SRK of shelling and sniping the civilian population. Further, the scheduled incidents were professionally and proficiently investigated by experienced local professionals, whose results were in many cases corroborated by independent UN investigations and independent experts. For none of the scheduled incidents is there any credible evidence pointing to ABIH responsibility or any credible evidence to suggest that the investigations were in any way manipulated. And as I just pointed out, the evidence shows that the Bosnian authorities could not possibly have been targeting its own civilian population with any kind of regularity. And for the vast majority of scheduled incidents, they could have no conceivable motive to do so. In summary, the contention that the Bosnian authorities were responsible for any of the scheduled incidents based on an allegedly, uh, on an isolated analysis of the analysis of allegedly inconclusive ballistics assessments is at most a speculative notion that does not give rise to a reasonable doubt. What is your position, Ms. Ms. Gustafsson, as to some evidence that alludes to the possibility of firing to the internationals? on the part of the APIH, uh, uh, um, profos, uh, in order to provoke the retaliation and, and to invite the in international intervention. Yes, Your Honors, there is some evidence of that as well. Again, it is largely based on rumors and, uh, and vague allegations, or for example, uh, the evidence of Edin Garaplia, who had tortured such a confession out of uh, an alleged perpetrator of such an incident. Um, but in any event, those... Uh, we have some evidence from the internationals as well. That's right. There is some evidence of this. Um, but the, the difference, Your Honor, would be that firing on the UN could have a conceivable uh, benefit of provoking international intervention as opposed to firing on just another civilian uh, within a pattern of hundreds of such events, which, uh, which would not have the same potential benefit of possibly provoking an international intervention. So I think the motive behind the two types of attacks would be very different. We may have passed this, this issue, but in addressing the difficulty of waging war in an urban setting, the accused referred to an example of mobile motor. Do you concede there existed the mobile motor on the part of the ABIH? And if yes, um, What kind of reaction would you expect on the part of the PSA side to respond to such attacks? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, the, it, there is evidence, clear evidence, I believe, that the ABIH had a handful of mobile mortars, and I refer, for example, to the evidence of Wilson and Azim Jambasevich, uh, who both uh, acknowledged a, a handful of such weapons. Um, and in terms of the SRK response, 
In fact, that the, the example I referred to earlier, that w where Wilson observed a few outgoing rounds of ABH fire and a response of 200 rounds scattered across a large urban area, uh, and a response he, he uh, described as entirely disproportionate, that was an example of a mobile mortar. And the response, of course, reflects an intent not to target that mobile mortar, uh, but to target civilian areas. And in that, that same example I referred, or that same uh, passage I referred to uh, Richard Mole's evidence, and one of the observations he had was that the delay in the response to outgoing fire indicated uh, that there was a uh, limited possibility of actually of the, the uh, unit still being in the same location. And that would apply, of course, very strongly to uh, mobile mortar rounds where the, mobile, the uh, mortar can be fired and then quickly moved out of position. Uh, so any response with any kind of delay by the SRK would again uh, reflect an intent simply to target civilian areas. And of course, there are other methods of taking out uh, a mobile mortar crew, for example, sniping at them if they, if they get into a line of sight of SRK snipers, which would of course be a far more precise and indeed effective means of responding to a mobile mortar attack. Thank you. Please continue. Well, I'd like to turn now to the defense argument at paragraphs 2163 to 2167 that uh, prosecution sniping expert van der Weyden could not conclude for the scheduled incidents the exact location the bullet was fired from. And therefore, according to the defense, the prosecution's sniping case should be dismissed in its entirety. And the chamber has specifically asked the prosecution to respond to this argument. Now first, let me make clear that the defense has mischaracterized van der Weyden's conclusions. Because for a number of incidents, for example, F1, F3, F6, F9, and F12, van der Weyden either concluded there was only one possible origin of fire or drew conclusions that excluded any reasonable possibility that the fire originated from ABIH held territory. And I will be referring to a couple of examples, but I would also refer to paragraphs 19, 27 to 29, 36, and 38 of Appendix C of our brief where that evidence is discussed. And of course, in every case, his conclusions are consistent with fire originating from well-known SRK sniper positions. But more importantly, the defense argument here is an example of just the kind of mistaken analysis I just alluded to. The defense is improperly attempting to draw conclusions based on just one aspect of the evidence. The defense ignores the fact that van der Weyden's conclusions form just part of the totality of evidence for each scheduled incident, evidence we've summarized in Appendix C of our brief, and further ignores the many other factors pointing to SRK responsibility that I have just outlined. Now, if that satisfies the Chamber's question, I'd like to turn now to discuss defense arguments on the scheduled incidents themselves. And in light of the limited time, I will address just a sample of these arguments. But I'd like to make clear that these samples exemplify the unfounded claims and unreliable conclusions that permeate the defense arguments on the scheduled incidents. And I'll start with F1. This is the 13 December 1992 attack on three-year-old Anissa Pita while she was taking off her shoes in front of her house. And as I indicated a moment ago, van der Weyden concluded that Baba Stiena was the only possible origin of the shot. That's P1521, page 16, and page 6995 to 6996 of the transcript. The defense challenges to this incident are centered on its claim that there was no line of sight to Baba Stiena. 
and they rely on Popperich's line of sight analysis. That's paragraphs 2184 to 2185, relying on D4884, paragraphs 26 to 28. However, Popperich based his line of sight analysis on a visit to the location in 2010. And he conceded that by this time, the house had been renovated and it was no longer possible to stand or crouch in the precise location of the victim. That's transcript page 39267. His line of sight analysis is therefore fundamentally flawed. The defense claim at paragraph 2186 that, quote, the most reasonable inference, end quote, is that Anissa Pita was wounded in an exchange of fire is based on Popperich's total speculation that because at one point the parents reported hearing several shots, Anissa Pita was most probably struck by a ricocheting bullet during an exchange of fire. That's D4884, paragraph 31. At paragraph 2187, the defense also relies on the evidence of Milos Skirba in asserting that the relevant brigade, the 1st Sarajevo Mechanized Brigade, had no sharpshooters throughout the war. It's D2344, paragraph 11. Skirba's assertion is not only implausible, it is directly contradicted by another defense witness from Skirba's own battalion, Malatic, who explained that the battalion had a sniper squad subordinated to the commander. That's D2519, paragraph 31. In any event, Skirba conceded all the underlying facts that allowed the SRK to shoot this child. Namely, Baba Stiena was a fortified SRK position held by SRK forces in possession of rifles, automatic, and semi-automatic weapons. And that's 29189 to 29194. <coughs> so in summary, this obviously civilian three-year-old child was targeted from a position with a clear line of sight, which defense witnesses conceded was held by SRK forces with the necessary weapons to shoot her. I'd like to move now to F4. This is the 3rd of September, 1993 shooting of Nafa Taric and her eight-year-old daughter. The defense claim at paragraph 2200 that there was no line of sight from Osrenska Street to the incident location is again based on Popperich's report. However, Popperich relied on photos that he himself admitted he had taken from the opposite side of the street from where the victim was located at the time of the attack. That's D4884, paragraph 56, and images 44 and 45. So Popperich's elaborate line of sight analysis in paragraphs 56 to 59 based on these photos is fundamentally flawed. In any event, the defense acknowledges at paragraph 2204 that Ivana Kurndelia Street, where the victims were shot, is clearly visible, those are the defense's words, from the alleged firing position, citing evidence including this photograph, D2431. The defense claim at paragraph 2204 that this location was not visible from fourth company positions is irrelevant. And that's because defense witness and fourth company member Slobodan Tshevelyak testified that this photograph was taken from positions held by the second company of the second battalion of the first Sarajevo Mechanized Brigade, a company positioned further down the street from his fourth company position. That's 29956 to 29957, and he was describing this photograph, D2431 or 65 Tur 23967. And this comparison of D2431 with D666, the photograph on which van der Weyden marked the location of the attack demonstrates that the precise location of the attack was in fact plainly visible 
from that second company position. And finally, the defense assertion at paragraph 2202 that Van der Weyden concluded that Osrenska Street was 1,104 meters from the incident site simply misrepresents Van der Weyden's testimony, which was in fact that the distance from Osrenska Street to the incident site was 825 meters. That's at page 7130 to 7131. Moving on to F5, this is the 2nd of November 1993 shooting of Rami Zakundo while carrying water. The defense assertion that the incident site was visible from ABIH positions at paragraph 2210, again, is based on Popperich's assertion in his report. However, in cross-examination, Popperich agreed that there were obstacles to both the left and right of the victim's location as depicted in image 50 of his own report, which we can see here. As you can see, there is a concrete wall on the left side and a wall of earth plus a radio tower on the right, and thus a natural tunnel. And Popperich agreed that, quote, any potential field of fire is bounded by this tunnel, this natural tunnel, end quote. That's page 39233. Nevertheless, in his report, Popperich drew the potential field of fire over these obstacles. And this is apparent from image 53 of his report, which we can see here. Now, as you can see, Popperich has depicted a wide field of fire, roughly 60 degrees, a field which clearly ignores the existence of the narrow natural tunnel, which he himself conceded limited the line of sight. And this omission allowed Popperich to stretch that field of fire sufficiently far south, as you can see, to encompass ABIH held territory. When Popperich was confronted with this discrepancy between the existence of the natural tunnel and the broad field of fire he depicted here, Popperich said, <coughs> quote, of course, all of this should be taken as not being exactly accurate, but there cannot be much deviation, if you will, end quote. That's page 39233 to 39233. The defense argument is thus based on an admittedly unreliable analysis, and there is certainly no reason to doubt Van der Weyden's assessed field of fire. And this exhibit, P6364, shows Van der Weyden's assessed field of fire for this incident. And that is the green triangle in the upper image, which is transposed over the field of fire identified by Popperich. And the relevant page of Van der Weyden's report is the image below. So as you can see, there was, in fact, no line of sight from ABIH held territory to the south as contended by the defense. And Van der Weyden also excluded the nearby territory to the southwest of the incident site because the dip in the road limited the view to positions further away. That's P1621, page 37. And finally, the defense claim in paragraph 2210 that there was no line of sight from SRK positions, which is based on paragraph 72 of Popperich's report, is contradicted by Popperich himself, who conceded a line of sight from SRK territory. And that's... Could you please slow down? Thank you. That's transcript page 38955 to 38956. Moving on to F6, the shooting of Sonia Devlon as she cycled home in Dobrynya just after emerging from behind a barrier protecting a bridge. And this is another example where Van der Weyden's conclusions were such that the only reasonable possibility for the origin of site, uh, sorry, or the origin of fire was an SRK position. 
He concluded that there was only one other building with a line of sight apart from the Orthodox Church. An ABIH held apartment building 355 meters from the attack location. However, he excluded this as a source of fire because of the unlikelihood that ABIH troops there. Uh, just a second. There seems to be a problem with the French Channel. We are getting English. Thank you. Okay, my apology to <laughs> Judge Lactanzi. Shall we continue? Thank you. Van der Weyden, <clears throat> as I was saying, excluded the ABIH held apartment building 355 meters away as a source of fire because of the unlikelihood that the ABIH troops there would have focused on the bridge with SRK's troops stationed in the buildings directly across the street to the east. That's P1621, page 50. He also eliminated the surrounding open areas because, of course, the shooter would have been exposed to fire from either side. That's page 7133. The defense assertion at paragraph 2217 that the bullet in this case would have to have been fired 0.99 seconds before the victim appeared from behind the barrier is based entirely on Popovich's demonstrably unreliable guesswork. For instance, from this photo here, which is image 59 of his report, Popovich took the approximate length of what he believed to be the car model, visible here, that he obtained from a Wikipedia article in order to determine the approximate distance Ms. Zevlin traveled after emerging from behind the barrier and before being shot. He then estimated the time it took Ms. Zevlin to bike across this alleged distance by relying on the purported average cycling speed of a 35-year-old female according to an inaccessible forensic examination of traffic accidents. That's D4884, paragraphs 79 and 88. The defense further claims at paragraph 2218 that van der Weyden agreed to possibilities other than intentional targeting of civilians in this case. This ignores van der Weyden's explanation that this is not what he would conclude because Ms. Zevlin would have been visible just before getting onto the bridge, which would allow would have allowed her shooter to anticipate her reappearance. That's page 7137 to 7138. And this fact also renders Popperich's already unreliable calculations on the timing of the shot as compared to the victim's exit from behind the barrier irrelevant, a point the defense has entirely ignored. And my last point on this incident the defense claim at paragraph 2218 that van der Weyden agreed that the lack of evidence regarding the bullet or caliber resulted in speculation about the origin of fire is a complete mischaracterization. Van der Weyden only agreed that he had to estimate the bullet caliber. He did not agree that this resulted in any speculation about the origin of fire. That's page 7138 to 71. Nine. Should I continue, Your Honours, or, or do you wish to take a break now? If it is con convenient, we'll take a break. It is. Thank you. We'll take a break for 20 minutes and resume at 11.30. 